Some claim that Zack Snyder is a misunderstood visionary, while others would call him a talentless hack. Me, myself, I'm ah, just kind of somewhere in the middle. And although I'm not a Snyder fanboy, I would sooner distance myself from the mob that seems to follow him around, impatiently waiting to call his latest production hot garbage. And that they certainly did. Rebel Moon was absolutely eviscerated by critics in the week leading up to its release. But Lord knows why some outlets are willing to pay some of these people to write. After all, they are 99.5% jelly and lack anything that could possibly resemble a backbone. So in my opinion, they would be best suited to deep sea filter feeding. But there we go. The point I'm trying to make is I have very little, if any, faith in their judgment. So let's see for ourselves just how bad or good Rebel Moon really is. But first, a word from today's sponsor. A big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Hi there, I'm Johnny Law, and I'm somewhat of a musician myself. Hi there, I'm Johnny Law, and I'm somewhat of a photographer myself. And as you can see, this bit here is, uh, is not the steering wheel. Uh, oh, hi there, you can see you there. My name's Johnny Law, and I'm, I'm somewhat of a mechanic myself. You ready? What? What, man, I like not play that one? Jeez, tough crowd. Hi there, I'm Johnny Law, and I'm somewhat of an astronomer myself. Yep, that's definitely the sun. Understandably, one cannot become as talented as I overnight, but there is a place where you can start, and that's with today's sponsor. Skillshare. Skillshare is renowned for its creative masterclasses, but did you know that it also has hundreds of career-focused classes as well, with classes in productivity, marketing, branding, business management, and much, much more. So Skillshare can help you get to grips with the essentials you'll need to reshape your work in life. Unfortunately, traditional jobs are not one size fits all, so right now is the perfect time to reinvent your future with the help of leading industry professionals and creatives. I've personally taken MKBHD's class in all things YouTube, and it's helped me to optimize my editing workflow. So how will you design your own career. Well, the first 500 people to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. I'd say that's a pretty good place to start. And thank you again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. The movie Rebel Moon started life as a Star Wars movie. Snyder had pitched it to Disney and Disney had turned it down. And I think that I might know why that is. And that is because the movie kicks off with what can only be described as a space vagina. But in the royal bloodlands lust for power, they consumed everything upon their planet. You thought I was joking, didn't you? You thought, oh, Johnny's trying to be funny again. No, look at it. Look at it. Now, come on. They, they knew what they were doing. And, it, and it's the very first shot of the movie. It can't just be me who sees it. And of course, Zack Snyder got a Zack Snyder. And he's cracked out a box of some of the most bonkers anamorphic lenses I've seen in a hot minute for this movie. Dude, look at the bokeh in the background. Thanks to whoever made this lens, I can now see the world as Robert Downey Jr. did in the 90s. Yes, very edgy. And mix Snyder's choice of lens with the fact that this movie is shot in ultra-wide. Zack has definitely landed himself a place on the scale of movie-making pretentiousness. And for those of you that don't know, there are three levels on the scale of movie-making pretentiousness. And level one is pretty tame, but is nonetheless pretentious. And that is when filmmakers choose to shoot in either 4x3 or ultra-wide, knowing very well that 95% of all screens on Earth are 16x9. So level 1 is dedicated to the filmmakers who can't decide which area of your screen to leave completely blank because they're just so quirky and creative. And then of course there's level 2, and what can I say about level 2 other than there's a special place in hell reserved for these kinds of filmmakers. The people who re-release pre-existing colour movies in black and white. They did it for movies like Parasite, Who, who watches a movie and says to themselves, oh, I love that movie so much, I'm going to rewatch it. But give it to me without any of the color. You insufferable swines. Go choke on a strip of cellulose nitrate, since you like being so quirky when it comes to film. You bumder! So, level one is shooting in 4x3 or ultra-wide, level two is shooting in black and white, so by now I'm sure you've gathered what level three entails. You got it. It's filmmakers who shoot in both 4x3 and black and white at the same time. Those people need to be sent to the most remote Soviet exclave possible so that they can learn to appreciate real estate and color. 
Ah, you think you're so edgy and artsy. I don't care that you own your own cafetiere. You probably wear a scarf in the summertime. And you and your communistical cliches can rot in Siberia for all I care. Rant over. Back to the movie. And hey, look! It's, it's, uh, it's just like A New Hope. Would you look at that? I mean, I know this was originally written as a Star Wars movie, but I bring it up because there's going to be quite a few references and inspirations popping up throughout this movie. The gods of the harvest demand a tribute. An offering. Wait, what the hell? Did you guys just see that? Roll the tape back. An offering. Look at that lens distortion. That is nuts. And look! If I could afford these kinds of lenses, I would 100% use them too. And I'd slap them right down to the lowest T-stop and shoot everything like that just because I could. But my God, that is a little bit much for just a casual shot. If someone's drunk or having like an episode or a flashback or some sort of seizure, that might make for a cool look. But for a regular shot, that's a little bit crazy. Look at this next shot. The lens is so nutty, it's literally skewing his face. It's like this permanent rolling shutter. And for those of you that aren't into photo or cinematography, that's not a good thing. And I tell you what, there are a lot of people who get on the case of the original Star Wars trilogy saying that it's a little bit on the nose when it comes to the mid-century German allegories. But if you are one of those people, just wait till you see this movie. I am Sindri, father of this village. Welcome. I'm Admiral Atticus Noble, loyal representative of the slain king. We have an intergalactic Hans Lander. <laughs> so the space Nazis arrive in a humble harvest village, kill the leader of said village, and then demand all of their crops in what is quite a drawn out scene. They've also got this guy who's going for the quirky unhinged villain kind of thing. And you get that in a lot of anime and it can often make for quite a cool character, but this guy doesn't quite stick the landing for me. <laughs> I'm gonna die, you do a boast. Okay. Yeah, it's coming off as just a little bit cringe. The main character isn't so bad. You know, she's tough, but she's not obnoxious. A little brooding, maybe, but that's not inherently a bad thing. She's a little tougher than you might expect and manages to single-handedly fight off a squad of soldiers who are all in good shape and are fully armed. Seems like a, a little bit of a reach to me, but maybe there's a reason as to why she's such a badass. I mean, we haven't actually learned all that much about her just yet, so... There might be some justification on the way. I fought for the king of distant worlds under the banner of a people who murdered my entire family. Okay, so it turns out she was raised as a child by one of the bad guys to become an elite soldier. I guess, uh, yeah, okay, I guess that works. But uh, it doesn't really explain why she would be capable of overpowering a squad of soldiers from that very same army who are, you know, probably not only trained more recently, but I've definitely seen action more recently and are more heavily armed and armoured. But uh, who cares? It, it makes for a cool looking scene, right? So the main character, whose name I can't actually remember, I think it's only been mentioned once so far, but the main character and that guy who not so subtly replaced that other guy in Game of Thrones that one time, who also just so happens to be one of the villains from this movie, those guys are looking for another guy. It's compelling stuff, I know. Well, a dynamic duo find the man that they're after and he is immediately and conveniently captured by a bounty hunter. It's like a video game. Plot only happens when main character. So a duo then walk into a cantina. <clears throat> Sorry, I mean bar. I don't know why I'd use a word like cantina. They walked into a bar where there's a buffet of ne'er-do-wells discussing various nefarious doings. And I hate to admit this, and I really, hate to admit this, but I am starting to see where all the critics were coming from when they were calling this movie derivative. So far, this is just a reskinned retelling of A New Hope. It starts with humble beginnings on a farm, dreaming of bigger things. You walk into a bar, you mind your own business at that bar, you get bothered at that bar by some ugly alien looking dude, and then after the confrontation, you find a gunslinger who just happens to own a ship and agrees to take you where you want to go. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what it is, it's just something about that that, that rings a bell. I, I just can't put my finger on it. This is the kind of thing I used to do as a kid back in school when they'd ask you to write a story in English class. I'd just write the plot to whatever my favorite movie was at that time. I once got a really good grade for just rewriting Howl's Moving Castle. To this day, one of my greatest achievements. That's, uh, that's not as much of a joke as I'd like it to be. At first, the references and similarities were kind of cute, but now it's getting to the point where it's starting to precariously walk the line between reference and just straight up plagiarism. But 
you know, I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt for now. You know, we'll press on because our duo needs to get to a planet called Bollocks. Guess we need to find a ship to take us to Bollocks. Well, you know, it's close enough. So they're on their way to Bollocks. Bollocks. But not before the epic slow mo fight scene. But in order to get to the penis bollocks, I mean planet Pollock, sorry, Freudian slip there. In order to get to the planet Pollock, they need Han Solo's ship. I don't know what the character's actual name is, but I'm going to call him Han Solo for now. And it's not just the Star Wars franchise that we're going to have the litigious trigger finger twitching. It's Harry Potter too. No one's safe. Oh, uh, thank you, Ripper Moon. Very cool. So then the gang travel to a cobalt mining planet. And, you know, there's a cool bit of design going on here. I mean, you know, cobalt, the substance itself is very angular and somewhat geometric. And that's reflected in the architecture on the planet. That's a nice little touch. Yeah, that's cool and all. But now a lady who I don't know is negotiating with an alien spider lady who I also don't know. And I can't help this overwhelming feeling that I don't know what's going on. I deserve justice. There is a difference between justice and revenge. I don't care. Who are you people? I also like that as soon as the Asian lady pulls out her swords, some very stereotypical Asian music starts playing, only it's like slightly more spacey. I mean, come on. You should have just full sent it and just played the da -da 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 And I'm not saying that in a how dare you be so culturally insensitive type way. I'm saying that in a we're balls deep in another universe right now. Why are we playing cultural music from Earth? Okay, that looks pretty cool. I assume they would have been lightsabers had this been an actual Star Wars movie. Like, you know, I can see what you were going for, but this isn't a, a Star Wars movie. So she, she's just got some hot knives. Cool. Yes, yes, honor and charity. Clubman is back, and I call him that not because that's his actual name, but rather because he seems to just roam about the galaxy clubbing people to death. That's his thing, apparently. Cool close-up, by the way. You know, this guy definitely has, like, the look and, and gravitas of a decent villain. Having said that, in a world full of plasma lasers and child-snatching alien spider women, a walking stick... Not quite as intimidating. Not quite as scary. No. Hey, look! It's an Urukai. At this point, we're just playing Spot the Franchise. So we then come to the first plot twist of the movie, and it turns out that Han Solo is actually a double-crossing backstabber and has sold the gang out to the big bad. By the way, I feel like I should point out the fact that uh, although this movie does contain a lot of unusually pronounced similarities to other franchises, they didn't actually go whole hog and just straight up call this guy Han Solo. I'm calling him Han Solo because I have actually no idea what his name is. In fact, I have no idea what anyone's name is because when they introduce someone, they do so just the once and, and that's your lot. So bring a notepad, I guess. Our protagonist then breaks free. There's a generous dose of how did you not get shot there? Wonder Woman punches an evil man in the heart and the goodies inevitably win. Tale as old as time. And during this whole ordeal, and by ordeal I mean prolonged gunfight, not one of the good guys perishes. And uh, you know, well, at least not one that you have any kind of connection with. There was that one guy that we met like three minutes ago, but uh, not the biggest loss, if I'm honest. The gang then return to the planet that we saw at the beginning of the movie, riding what are definitely not just a bunch of horses wearing masks. We've got Hot Knife Lady, Solomon from Blood Diamond turned up. <laughs> The original two protagonists, of course, that one guy who managed to tame Buckbeak, and the most emotionally stable Twitter user. No! It then ends with a little bit of a plot twist. It turns out that the big bad that we thought was dead isn't actually dead, and credits roll. Now, other than crazy South African mercenary number two, the cast did a decent enough job. It's a nice movie to look at. The CG is well executed for the most part. There's the odd green screen here and there that looks a little ropey. But the CG they did implement was often used in a pretty creative manner and they used it to make visuals that you don't typically see in film. And that's a trait that most modern productions lack when it comes to using computer generated images. CGI these days is predominantly used to polish off movies uh, or to make scenes easier, if not cheaper, to film. So it's nice to see a bit of creativity here and there. I like the bullet effects. They are actually quite original. Rather than just being hard projectiles or a light beam, 
you know, they look like molten plasma of some sort. They've got like a liquidy quality to them that looks pretty sweet. And like most Snyder movies, there's a whole bunch of scenes that would make for pretty cool desktop wallpapers. There's a lot of 300 style slow-mo combat, which a lot of people write off as mindless war porn, but I personally think of it as very cool. I mean, gun go pew pew, and I like that. I'm a simple man with simple taste, but that is where the positives end, unfortunately. There's definitely a bit of a pacing issue when it comes to this movie. There are certain scenes like the one with the alien spider lady that lack any context before they drop you face first into the scene and it then moves so quickly you're left wondering what on earth is going on, while other scenes move at a pace that can only be described as glacial. Like maybe the fact that the first, I don't know, half an hour of the film is spent talking about grain. Now I don't feel as though I should have to point this out, but no one cares about arable farming in a space movie. The overdubbing, particularly towards the first half of the film, is a little loose. Like the, the mics are just a little bit out of time and it makes for a little bit of a weird experience, like listening to dialogue and watching it. I mean, you know, it doesn't render the movie completely unwatchable, but it's a little bit odd. And even excluding all of the uh, reappropriated plot points from other famous franchises, you're still left with a lot of lazy derivatives in this movie. For example, there's a bunch of deer that just look like deer. The horses. They're just normal horses, except they have weird things on their heads. Rebel Moon is not as original as it could have been with some of its design. Now, one thing that I do genuinely appreciate about Zack Snyder as a director is his willingness to take sizable and numerous creative risks. That is certainly more than can be said for a lot of his slightly more invertebraic contemporaries. No, that's not a word, but yes, I am using it. But taking creative risks is a double-edged sword. Sometimes you end up with a classic like 300, and sometimes you end up with Suicide Squad. Now, although Rebel Moon, in my opinion, is not as bad as Suicide Squad, it does certainly land on that side of the Snyderverse. Which is a real bummer, because this movie could have been one big triumphant middle finger to Kathleen Kennedy and all of modern Star Wars, but it pains me to say this, that this just wasn't the modern Star Wars killer that I hoped it would be. I still like and appreciate Snyder as a director, but this one didn't quite hit the way I thought it might. And while there was nothing wildly offensive about this movie, and it was, you know, decent to look at for the most part, its story and dialogue were odd and mostly uninspiring and occasionally reappropriated, would be the diplomatic way of saying plagiarized. The passion was there, but it just didn't quite stick the landing for me. Have you watched Rebel Moon? If you did, what did you think? Let me know, and I'll catch you in the next one. And of course, a big shout out to the patrons and the channel members. We have the top tiers, the Knights of Law. We've got Flunky, Puzzlebun, Infinite Dum Dum, David Jax, Koss, ATS, Texas Lawman, Michael Terpia, Dagger D69, nice, Saint Nemo, Steve the Goat, Nystagmus, Michael Spakowski, the Grand Admiral, and we're welcoming Saitama Kano to the top tier. Thank you very much for joining, my friend, and allow me to knight you, Sir Kano of Law. Welcome to the top tier, my friend. I do very much appreciate you joining. And of course, we've got the tier two. We've got Saeed, Dr. Melsky, Yonwich, Hadziu, Kana Dogramachi, Mark Main, and Sensei Fang, Mendicant Bias, Rich Warwick, Michael S, Stu Cheeks, Agent MO62, Kidnap Tiger, Micah and Jarek, and McLegend Face. And of course, a big thank you to each and every one of the tier ones as well. To everyone on this list, thank you very much for supporting me. I hope you all had a great Christmas, and I look forward to seeing you in the new year. And there we go, another day, another video. Will you join me for my next one? You better do. You little bitch. But until then, take care of yourselves and I'll see you all very soon.